Good evening. We want to share a story with you today. Our story: How we start working together, a mechanical engineer and a plant biologist. Yeah, our story: How we started working together to determine how to sustain the crop yield in the future facing climate change. So, Dr. Han and I joined the University of Mississippi the same year. We became friends since then. However, we still have no clue about each other's research details. We rarely talk about the work until one day I mentioned to him that I just purchased a lot of house plants. So I asked him why so many, and he said, "Well, I said I'm not going to brag about it, but actually I killed a lot." <laughs> I was thinking, wait, isn't he a plant biologist? Aren't you supposed to save them, not kill them? So he mocked me, but he also learned that. A plant has a much harder life than our human beings. They are bombarded with all kinds of environmental stresses, such as the heat stresses, the cold stresses, high light intensity, water stresses, flooding, nutrient deficiency, and pathogen attacks, just to name a few. So plants cannot move, so they have to cope with all these type of stresses and manage to survive and propagate under terrible conditions. So that is when I learned his studies. How plants sense and respond to the temperature changes. Dr. Chiao also told me how the heat wave and the freezing temperature damage the vegetables, fruit, and the crop. Climate change is not something new. However, it has been happening at a higher frequency and in a broad area. Then he mentioned one more thing. So I pointed out the misconception. That is, many people think that only the extreme temperatures. Will trigger will affect plants, and non-stressful temperature do not. However, the truth is, plants are so sensitive to temperature changes they can detect merely a one degree Celsius shift in the environment, and adjust their development accordingly. As the global climate change also leads to a gradual increase in the average temperature, so I'm also interested to study how plants cope with the smaller changes in the environment temperature. So I showed Dr. Han a video showing that the seedling growing at a lower temperature, 20 degrees Celsius, and a warmer temperature, 27 degrees Celsius. Neither temperature triggers stress response in plants, so both fall into the comfortable zone for the plant growth. However, the seedling growing at the warmer temperature has a much faster elongation speed of the, in the stem and also in the petiole, and more dramatic uplifting in the leaves. That's a big difference. However, I still got confused about the consequences. Why it matters? So I showed Dr. Han another example. I said, "Let's imagine. Now we have some wheat plants just reached the stem extension stage, and the wheat plants growing at a warmer temperature will reach a much higher height after the vegetative growth compared with the plants growing at a cooler temperature. So now, imagine what will happen if strong winds or heavy rains hit these plants." So the taller one would bend over, I guessed. Exactly. So this is a phenomenon called lodging, which will affect the flowering, fertilization, grain maturity, and also harvesting. So all these will lead to a great loss in the yield. Lodging is a long-lasting problem in agriculture, and now how to reduce lodging is an urgent topic to be solved as we face a warmer Earth. I got his point. I finally understood that. Even a moderate increase in environmental temperatures will dramatically affect plant growth. Yes. So I also added that lodging caused by this、uh, stem, exaggerated stem elongation is only one problem that created by these moderate increased temperatures. Warm but non-stressful temperature will also lead to many other responses in different organs, such as in the roots, in the leaves, and also in the flowers. Just name a few. So understanding how temperature shapes plants will be very important for guide us in designing and breeding climate resilient crops, and also moreover, revealing the precise mechanisms how the plant responds to its temperature is very important to illuminate the fundamental principles by which all life forms on Earth deal with temperature. So as an engineer, the word I picked up on designing temperature response. And precise mechanism. Interesting, I said, but still I got no clue how he would investigate those phenomena and review the mechanisms. But then he started with computer metaphors. How could I resist? 
Yes, I mentioned computer. I said, as a molecular biologist, I treat an organism like a computer. Not a perfect analogy, but they do share some similarities. A computer receives the input signal from the outside world, processes the information using complicated circuits, generates output signal, and eventually presents the results to us. So similarly, a plant senses the change in the environment, such as the temperature change, processes the signal, and generates signal to deal with it, and eventually reacts to it. So therefore, your job is to identify the components in the process and the connection among those components, right? Yes, exactly. So we have used various two approaches to identify what type of components are involved in the plant thermosensory pathways. For example, if I want to find out what kind of players are involved in the heat-induced stem elongation, I randomly mutagenize the genes in the plant genome, and then I grow these plants at a warmer temperature. So I look for the plants that cannot extend their stem at a warmer temperature, and investigated what type of gene has been mutated. So thanks to the fast advancement of DNA sequencing technology, now we can more easily identify the genes, the identity, and also understand how they regulate the thermal responsive pathways. That seems like a lot of work. Yes, indeed. I admit it. Actually, so not only me, this is not a one-man job. A lot of laboratories in the whole world are contributing to this. So by using various tools in genetics, molecular biology, biochemistry, cell biology, and also system biology, we have revealed more and more thermal sensing and thermal response components. So some of these are actually potential thermal sensors while transduce the temperature information to downstream responders. Some are transcription factors that control the expression of genes whose products will promote the stem elongation or flowering times. And also some are molecular chaperones or enzymes that are involved in the signal transduction or amplification. So in the next 30 minutes, I kept talking about all these type of components and their functions until Dr. Han got bored. Of course I got bored. I'm not a plant biologist. I don't care too much about those details. But then Dr. Cho mentioned something that is really interesting to me. He said, there's a potential problem in the current study. Yeah, I explained to him that as more and more components in the thermal sensory pathway have been discovered, we start to realize that not all the components operate at the same time or in the same location. For example, scientists have discovered that when temperature increases, a critical regulator in the leaves will accumulate and promote the production of a plant hormone called auxin. Auxin will be transported to the stem through the vascular cylinder, where it is distributed to different cell layers and promote the cell elongation. So in other words, the heat-induced Stem elongation requires signaling components from another organ, the leaves. So now, we need to understand how inter-organ communication works. So, how are you going to start it? I sense there was something he may need my help with. So to this end, there are two complementary research directions. On the one hand, we'll look into the thermal responses when the whole plant experiences temperature elevations. On the other hand, also we look into the thermal responses when only one type of organ or cell experiences temperature increases. So we do have tools to investigate the first direction. But they need help with the second. Exactly. So that's where Dr. Han's expertise came in. And I asked him, do you think there's any way we can heat up just one organ or cell in tiny ceilings like those ones just starting to emerge from the soil? I was thinking, Dr. Cho needs a device that is small enough to, um, to heat just a single organ or cells so that other organ or cells will not be stimulated simultaneously. Yeah. So I told him, for this kind of device, it should be small scale, minimally invasive, and have a good heating performance. Then I asked him, what is the size of your plant? So for most of the organs and also cells I'm working with the plants, that are actually in the millimeter to micrometers range. So there are tiny ceilings growing on the pitch dish. So for this case, the commercial heater definitely is out of the question. So comparing the size of a commercial heater and the size of one leaf, is like we comparing the size of a building and the human. So with this size, we definitely cannot use a commercial heater. Moreover, flexibility is another issue. 
So most of those commercial heaters are made from the rigid material. So it will be difficult for us to conformly attach the heater to the plant surface. Without the co close contact between the surface and the heater, it will be impossible for us to precisely control and monitor the temperature at the designated area. So then I asked Dr. Han, is there any manufacturing technology you can use to fabricate microheaters? Photolithography actually is the first technology that came to my mind. It can create the features with less than 100 nanometers. Mm. So the chips you used in your cell phone, computer, or any other electronic devices are actually fabricated by this, te this technology. But then I told Dr. Cho, I think it's impossible for us to use it due to the complexity and the cost of the process. So one commercial photolithography machines can easily cost over $100 million. Wow. So with this price, you can imagine how complex the process is. Then I thought of the 3D printing. Some of the printing technology actually can create the small things. Inkjet printing is one of the simplest, fastest, and cheapest process. I can create a tiny feature with sub-micron resolutions mm. when combining the inkjet printing and the voltage. So the voltage here is used to create an electrostatic force that, will, that is the primary driving force to carry out the ink. Moreover, this force will form a cone shape at the nozzle tip, thus allowing the creation of the tiny features. This process is really simple and less expensive. So I was so glad that he was thinking about things like cost. So we decided to go forward with this plan using the 3D printing technologies. So to print the heaters, we're using the silver-based nanomaterials. This material has excellent electrical and thermal conductivity, flexibility, and stretchability. So the fabricated devices can conform attached to the non-flat surface. We designed a wild heater that can be used for the external heating of the plant parts, such as the roots, the leaves, and the stems. We also design a wellness heater that can be implanted inside the cell for the internal heating. So we should, I should add that Dr. Han has successfully printed both types of microheaters. So now, how can we use or control these microheaters then? So we have a heating system that can automatically control the temperature of the heater. Since this is an autonomous system, we don't need any person to be present and control the system. Moreover, this system can be controlled remotely. So this system basically is like the temperature controlling system you use in your AC or refrigerator. Mm. We just need to set the temperature and let the system do the job. So now we have the tool you need. How do you plan to use it? So first, we we'll use the microheaters to validate whether the, when the organs were working autonomously and when the organs will work with the other organs in the thermal response. And next, we will test whether cells are working autonomously or with the other type of cells. For example, when the leaves stimulate the growth hormone production at a warmer temperature, which cell layers are responsible for such production? And what components are involved in their regulation? When stem elongates at a warmer temperature, do all the cell layers grow simultaneously? How do they coordinate the growth speed? And what components are involved in the coordination? So that's a great plan. I hope these micro devices can help us advance the understanding of the internal communication of the plant and the plant response to the temperature changes. Yeah, I also hope Dr. Han will find many more uses of his micro devices. I'm already exploring the idea of some acupuncture, some therapy, ECG sensors, humidity sensors, and more. I can foresee the reduced cost and increase the flexibility of the biological research and healthcare related instrument. So, what are we waiting for? Let's hit some plants. Sure, no problem. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>